And good morning, everybody, for, for my part as well. It's good to be here. It's, uh, it's been an interesting trip for me, but I'll, not, I'll just skip all the details and let's get into the real meat of the matter. I think I finally made it professionally after working 20 years in this business. Yesterday we were looking at um, some botnet command and control servers and uh, I was notified by a fellow researcher that one of the host names that a botnet was connecting to was in Kazakhstan, so top level domain KZ, Mikko Hyppönen sucks. It's operational right now at, uh, at the IP address right, right there, so you can, we haven't taken it down yet. I, uh, how could I be angry about that, right? You know? It's most likely related, related to the same gang who was operating Predolab earlier. But, and of course, if you're interested on in who registered the domain, you can go and uh, check it out from the who is. It's by Danko Danchev <laughs> from Gainesville. I didn't know Danko lives in Gainesville, but that's... <laughs> so I must have been doing something right, I guess. After working 10 years, at F-Secure, I got a watch, a Swiss watch, Omega, nice. After working 20 years at F-Secure, I got an extra week of summer holiday. My summer holiday is now five weeks, which is nice. And of course, the, the logic for why I got an Omega is that the very first virus we ever analyzed at F-Secure was called Omega. I know because I named it. I analyzed it in 1991. And uh, I named it Omega because it displayed the Omega sign on screen. And then we started a tradition that when you've been 10 years with the company, you get an Omega watch. So I know you're thinking what I'm thinking. I should have named the virus Ferrari, right? <laughs> Next time. But we all work in one way or another with security or computer security. And when we work in security, what we are ultimately doing is that we are helping people. People obviously cannot hope to cope with today's computer security problems by themselves. I mean, normal human beings can't do it anymore. It's way beyond that. If you look at just, just viruses, I mean, that's something that people used to know that they were infected because viruses would do something, you know. At the very least, they would be destructive. People know that there's something going on because they are going to lose all the files on their computers or the computer keeps crashing or rebooting or a virus plays music or shows funny animations, something like that. Well, today, nothing like that happens. Today's malware won't slow down your PC, won't crash your PC, won't delete anything, won't play music, won't do anything that you would actually know it's happening. You get infected by something like TDL4, you won't be able to tell. And even if you somehow learn that you're infected, you will not be able to get rid of it by yourself. So the end users need us. And that's basically our job, to help the ones who can't help themselves. And the best way for us to help the ones who can't help themselves is to understand who we are fighting. If we want to secure computers, sure, we can run all the firewalls and do all the backups and, and do the patching and you know, whatever you, you can think of, but that's actually not going to make the problem smaller. That's like a band-aid, right? It, it helps with the immediate pain, but it does nothing to reduce future attacks. The only way to reduce future attacks is to understand where the attacks are coming from and try to do something to minimize that. And the attackers keep changing. During the 20 years I worked in this business, they've changed several times. When I started, almost all the attackers were doing the attacks for fun. For, for fun, for challenge, for fame, maybe. That's what they were. Teenagers hacking servers for excitement. And of course, there are still at attackers like that as well. But overall, today, I would group all the attacks into three main groups. We have, first of all, the organized criminal gangs who do the attacks to make money. Second of all, the hacktivists. And third, attacks launched by countries and nation states. That's where the main attacks are coming from. And I decided to give you examples of, of each of these. 
So, organized criminal gangs. Who's he? Scarface, right? How are you doing, Scarface? Are you, are you there? Good. <laughs> this is not the kind of criminal we're fighting when we're fighting organized crime on the net. We're not talking about real-world mafia. We're talking about completely new kind of organized crime. In fact, let's think about organized crime. What is organized crime? What was organized crime 10 years ago? 10 years ago, organized crime was drug trafficking, money laundering, smuggling, stuff like that. Since that, over the last 10 years, in addition of that type of international organized crime, we, have suddenly, we are now suddenly facing all this internet organized crime, which didn't really exist in the sense 10 years ago. I mean, nobody was writing viruses to make money 10 years ago. It started pretty much around 2002, 2003. And that means that the overall amount of international crime has just exploded over the last 10 years. What about the resources to fight international crime? Ha have those resources also exploded? No, they haven't. In fact, they're pretty much exactly the same resources we had 10 years ago. Things like Europol and Interpol and so on. And we are actually doing a lousy job in fighting international crime when it comes to online crime. And that's one of the main, main challenges we have. We pretty well know what we are supposed to do. We're supposed to use international law enforcement to catch international criminals and put them behind the bars, but we are doing a lousy job in actually doing that. Although these guys aren't real gangsters, they like to look like gangsters. For example, this is Gangster Bucks, a website operating in St. Petersburg, run by Russians specializing in buying infected computers or buying access to infected computers. So if you are a virus writer but you don't, how, don't know how to monetize the computers you infect, you can simply sell the computers you've infected to these guys and they'll pay you money. The money depends on which country the infected computer is in. Here's another one. This is uh, iframebiz.com, used to run in St. Petersburg. It's, it's been down now for a year or so. But it sort of gives you a good impression of the kind of uh, lifestyle these guys would like to try to impose on virus writers, you know? Write viruses, make money, buy a BMW, impress girls, you know, that kind of lifestyle. But is it really like that? Is that really how virus writers live? Do they really make money with viruses? Well, here's a photo which was found during forensic examination of a drop site, a server which was used in an operation related to banking Trojans. While doing forensic examination, there was this deleted folder which was found, and that folder had a bunch of images taken with a digital camera. One of the images is this. We tried to estimate how much money there is in the photo. It's around one and a half million dollars. Yeah, and yes, that looks like a lot of money, but we have to remember that the value of dollar has been going down. <laughs> so it's the lifestyle of Online criminals and virus writers really like this. Well, actually, yes, it pretty much is. This is Albert Gonzalez, photographed at the uh, penthouse suite of, I believe, the W Hotel, which is one of the most expensive hotels in New York. Um, this is his partner in crime, Mr. Stephen Watt, known online as a Unix terrorist. If you actually go online, you'll find a video of his DEF CON talk from DEF CON Las Vegas from 19... I don't know, 2002 maybe, something like that. He was, here he's photographed partying at the private pool of uh, another expensive New York hotel. So how can these guys afford a lifestyle like this? Well, of course, they're not paying these bills with their credit cards. They're pay paying them with our credit cards. So these guys were Americans, but the majority of the attackers actually are not. In fact, if you look at the hotspots globally, of course, Russians, or Russia, Ukraine, Kazakhstan, Belarus, here in Europe, maybe Romania. Uh, Moldova produces much more malware than, than they should for a country of that size. <laughs> um, China, uh, Brazil, and so on. Here's Dmitry Golubov from Ukraine, Rex next to him, Vladimir Chachin from the city of Tarto in Estonia. Examples of the kind of guys who are 
behind these attacks. And of course the mechanisms vary, but they are basically typically in the range of rogue antiviruses, rogue registry cleaners, which are pushed to end users, keyloggers to steal the credit card numbers, banking trojans to move money around from online banks. Here's uh, the Swedish Björn Sundin, together with his partner in crime, uh, Charles Kumar Jain from United States. These guys were behind the IMU operation. So the actual uh, coders who were writing the malware these guys were using to become rich were all Ukrainians. But these guys were not Ukrainians. They were running an international grind gang where the actual coders were in Ukraine, but they themselves were mostly in USA. These guys are still on the run. This picture is from Interpol pages, from the Wanted pages. Nobody knows where they are, but the Secret Service from the United States froze a Swiss bank account belonging to Charles Kumar Jane around two months ago, and that bank account had 14.9 million US dollars on it. So the amount of money these guys are making is significant. Last statistics from Brazil say that the Brazilian banks lost 480 million US dollars to banking Trojan attacks during the first half of this year. So there's somebody walking around on the streets of Sao Paulo with 480 million US dollars in their pockets. Think about that. That's a lot of money, especially in Brazil. That is a lot of money. In fact, quite surprisingly, Brazil is the number one country in the world in producing banking Trojans. Brazilian banks have probably the best security mechanisms I've seen anywhere else because the attacks are so bad. And even though the mechanisms are great, they are still broken all the time, regardless of what kind of mechanisms they've tried. And they've tried pretty much everything, including, of course, one-time passwords, challenge response pairs, um, uh, custom-made Java interfaces for the online bank, <laughs> Java. They've also tried Secure ID chips, they've tried SMS authorization, all that, and everything has been broken. In fact, we saw last spring one really, really clever attack against a Brazilian bank called Caixa. And that attack is so clever that I actually cannot figure out a way on how to stop it. I can't imagine any authorization mechanism which would fix that problem. And the way that particular banking Trojan worked is that first you get infected, as usually you get infected by surfing the web with your Windows computer, you get hit by a drive-by download because you have an unpatched Adobe PDF Reader plugin inside your browser or you have unpatched Java or unpatched uh, QuickTime or something like that. But once you're infected, the only thing that the Trojan does is that it waits for you to log into this bank's website. And once you log in, to the bank's website, it doesn't modify your payments, it doesn't change anything, it just displays an extra, one extra page between the login and before you actually enter the bank. And that page was an advertisement. Advertisement which looked like it's an advertisement from the bank. It had the bank logos, different animations, very well done, most likely done with some ad agency. And the ad told the user that we have now launched a new investment product, a new investment account, and if you put money into this account, it gives you 5 to 2% annual return on your investment. And now, during this week, if you start investing and you invest more than 2,000 riyas on this investment account, you get a free Nintendo Wii. And there's an image of Nintendo and Mario and animations. And then it continues, to start investing, into your investment account, please move at least 2,000 rias to your investment account number this and this. So people read this and they see that's a great deal. That's a good return. That's not too much money. Absolutely, I want a Nintendo Wii. So now the user himself really wants to move his money to this account. <laughs> so then users click OK to continue. Now they are in the real bank and they really believe it's a real thing. And now they will be themselves going through all the hoops. They will be using their security chips or answering text messages, whatever the bank is trying to do to prevent banking Trojans. And it all goes through. How do you fix that? I don't know. I don't know. How do you fix credit card theft? Well, 
First, we have to look who's actually paying for the credit card fraud. In most cases, it's not the credit card companies. In most cases, it's the online merchants who get, get fooded with the bill once keyloggers steal people's credit card numbers, and then those card numbers are used to buy stolen, uh, uh, buy goods like iPhones and sell them further, or use these credit card numbers in online games like poker games to move money away from the accounts. One more example of banking Trojans. Postbank in Germany introduced text message uh, auth um, authentication around a year ago. And the reason why they introduced this SMS text message authentication is very clear. Banking Trojans sitting on the computer can change the accounts you think you are sending money to. So you go to an online bank and you think you are sending 100 euros to your electricity company to, to pay your electricity bill. And the Trojan on your computer changes the account to a different number and off, off, your goes, off, off the money goes. The way they decided to fix that is that every time you send money, it sends you a text message to your phone. And then, of course, on your text message, you will see the real account number. And you'll figure out that, you know, there's something wrong because the account numbers don't match. That's a great idea. Excellent. Foolproof. Can't be hacked. Right? Wrong. This is what the real page looks like when you go there from a clean computer. When you go there from an infected computer, the page changes. And now it explains to you that the bank has introduced another new security feature, which is a mobile security app. Please give your mobile phone number here so we can send you Sicherheitskontrolle, a security control program running on your phone. And they have a version for Android, for Symbian, and Blackberry. And then when you install this on your phone and continue doing banking from the infected Windows computer, when it triggers a text message to your phone, this Sicherheitskontrolle will intercept the text message and reply back that, yes, please move the money. And the user never even sees the message. So it's a game of cat and mouse. Whatever obstacles we can throw in the way of these guys, they can figure a way around it. It's just like, I mean, lock picking. Exactly the same problem. Even the best minds in the world, whatever lock they can imagine, of course it can be picked. Everything can be broken. If it, it can be hard, but it can be done. Right? So what about group number two? Online social activists. Groups like Anonymous, groups like Lalsec. I'm in charge at F-Secure for what we call TRAP, uh, Threat Assessment Program, which is where we try to forecast the future, try to, try to see where we're going and come up with uh, plans on how to, how, to, how to be ready for future changes. And this was one thing that I missed. Overall, we were trying to think what's going to happen in the future, and we didn't really see this happening. This has been a fairly rapid change. A year ago, of course, Anonymous existed, but they were no, nowhere nearly as active and visible as they are today. A big part of this, of course, is related to WikiLeaks. And just like Anonymous, WikiLeaks has been around for years and years, five years or so. But they weren't really very visible un un until they started leaking information related to US government, including the Iraq war files and the embassy cables, which really made them a high profile operation. Which, of course, caused into problems after Visa and MasterCard stopped money traffic in donations to WikiLeaks. As we know, very quickly, Anonymous took offense in that and started the large-scale denial-of-service attacks against Visa and MasterCard, and quite surprisingly, shutting down, at least briefly, but shutting down anyway, both Visa.com and MasterCard.com. And by the way, Visa.com runs on top of Akamai, so it's, it's actually pretty interesting that these guys were able to shut it down with fairly simple attacks. There's also one lesson to be learned there. Uh, at the same time when the denial of service attacks were targeting Visa.com and MasterCard.com. Um, the same attackers also tried shutting down PayPal. PayPal.com, because PayPal had also shut down donations to WikiLeaks. And PayPal.com didn't go down. Their systems were good enough, no problem. So what did the, did the attackers do? Well, they looked for alternative targets and they found PayPal's blog, which is running at PayPalBlog.com. And when PayPal had been securing their systems, they had made the conscious decision that the crucial resource is paypal.com. That's what we have to protect. Our block is not crucial. And of course, it went down. And of course, that's not too bad. 
But that's not the way the media saw it. If you go back and read the headlines from February, what the media was writing that Visa, MasterCard and PayPal were all down because PayPal block was down. And there's a lesson to be learned here. Like when you are securing your systems, you have to secure even the, even the systems which aren't actually important. Or otherwise, the public and the media will assume that you were taken down, even though you weren't really taken down. What was taken down in this case wasn't crucial in any way. So this is Aaron Barr, who used to be the CEO of uh, HP Gary Federal, security company which was specializing in producing consulting and products for US government. And one thing they were specializing in was in, uh, intelligence gathering from social networks. So Mr. Barr got interested in Anonymous and infiltrated Anonymous, which wasn't really that hard. I mean, you just find the discussion boards and the IRCs and you go there as one of them. He had multiple different personas and he was there for several weeks collecting information and intelligence, nicknames, IP addresses, stuff like that. Then he goes and gives an interview about the topic to uh, Forbes, where he explains that he's done all this and he's going to give a talk about this at the B-side San Francisco in, at the same time with the RSA conference in March. Bad idea. He gave the interview on Friday. He was supposed to give the talk on Tuesday. He never gave the talk because during the weekend between these two events, his home server was hacked. His Facebook was hacked. His Twitter was hacked. His Gmail was hacked. HP Gary Federal's website was defaced. HP Gary Federal's uh, file server was hacked and their email server was hacked. And the attackers published the whole five-year history of the email uh, server. In fact, they published on a server here in Switzerland on anonleaks.ch. It's still online today. Right now, anybody can go and search the whole five-year history of this company for anything they're interested in, including all the private emails, all the confidential emails, all the classified emails, all the email exchange between the US government and HP Gary Federal is right there. And that's a pretty devastating attack. And that's a good example of how ruthless a group like this can be when they feel threatened or when they attack against somebody they perceive um, as a threat. And here's a photo I took at the RSA conference where HP Gary was supposed to have a booth. They didn't. They cancelled their booth. And in, in fact, here it says that uh, they are not going to have booth because in addition to the data theft, HP Gary individuals have received numerous threats of violence. So they had to cancel their booth. So who are these people? Well, there's been quite a few arrests in, I think, six or seven countries. I think the total count is now 160 people arrested. Um, this is from Spain, when Spanish police arrested like 16 anonymous activists, and they basically gave a press conference that, you know, anonymous has been arrested, the whole problem is now over. And the next day, for some mysterious reason, policia.es was crashed with denial of service attack. So it wasn't that simple. But if you look beyond just the fact that there's been arrests and have a look at, okay, what do these guys look like? So here's some of the people who have been arrested in the United States. And it's sort of the kind of guys, um, or in USA and UK, and it's sort of the guys you, you, you're expecting, like, you know, angry young men, right? But that's not the whole story. Here's two more mugshots. This is uh, Tracy Ann Valenzuela, and that's Mercedes Renee Hoffer. She's 42, she's 20. Not the traditional angry young man at all. So like they, they, so like they say themselves, uh, we are all anonymous. So we are all members of anonymous and none of us are members of anonymous. And this is, this is the next generation that's growing up. And this is the, this is the way it is. P protesting has changed. And it's not going to go away. So the last group we have criminals, we have hacktivists, and then we have countries launching these attacks. 
And when we talk about attacks launched by countries and nation states, there's a range of things, like espionage, spying. Spying has completely, almost completely moved to the online world because, well, what is spying? Spying is collecting information. What is information? Well, information is data. Of course it is data now. Spying used to be something where you had to physically enter a building to copy papers because information was on paper. Now it is not on paper. Now it's data, which means you can reach it, at least in theory, from anywhere in the world. So espionage is one thing. Then we have attacks like uh, governments attacking their own citizens. Examples from Iran, examples from Germany. Bundestrojan or Staatstrojan or whatever you call it, R2-D2. And then we have, for the lack of a better word, things like cyber war or online warfare, of which we haven't really had very, very good examples yet, but we will. Because military has changed. That's a great weapon, like throw <laughs> tanks at your enemy, that's going to do it. I can't explain the image, I just found it online, but I, uh, I'm fascinated by the mechanisms of this. <laughs> so, <clears throat> espionage is mostly done by targeted attacks, and targeted attacks means that you receive an email, which is convincing. You receive an email from your friend, from your colleague, from your customer, and it contains an attachment which is relevant, like this example. That's a PDF file which was sent to a a technical engineer at a defense contractor, and the PDF contents are about high-efficiency DC-DC converters, which is what the guy was working with. But it's trojanized. By the time you have it on your screen, you've already been infected by a backdoor, which connects from your computer to an outside address. Who's, whoever is at that address has full access to your PC and full access to everything you can access in your local area network. And we've seen a lot of these. Here's another PDF, contains a trojan, Here's another PDF, contains a Trojan. Here's another PDF, contains a Trojan. Here's another PDF, contains a Trojan. Another one. Well, this is actually a Word file, so not all of them are PDFs. But PDFs are the most common ones, though. This talks about some UNICEF meetings, contains a Trojan. Here's an Excel file, contains fairly realistic-looking content, but it contains a Trojan. Another one. Here's another PDF file. Here's another one sent to an Air Force uh, uh, general. This is a Word file, we found this like five days ago. Then we have these as well, like this, this content, not all of them are like business content. I don't know who she is, but this was one of the files we found like two weeks ago, contains a Trojan, and so on, and so on, and so on. That's a PowerPoint file. And we do see these in all different languages. Here's Russian, this is German, Speichersystem, Leistungsmerkmal, Todestrafe. My German is rusty, but it looks fairly convincing to me. I don't speak Arabic, but I'm convinced that's fairly convincing as well. <laughs> so who's he? Well, this is Alfred Nobel. Alfred Nobel, the, the guy who innovated dynamite. And because dynamite ended up being used in wars, he got a bad conscience out of it when he got older, so he created this Nobel Peace Prize. So who won Nobel Peace Prize a year ago, last year? It was a guy called Liu Xiaobo, this guy right here, a Chinese dissident who were not able to pick up the Peace Prize in person because he's under house arrest in China. This here is NobelPeacePrize.org, which is a website run in Oslo, and pretty much exactly a week after this Peace Prize was announced, this website was hacked. It was hacked, and somebody inserted a drive-by download with one line of JavaScript to every single page on NobelPeacePrize.org, and that one line of JavaScript launched an attack with a zero day against Firefox. So if you visited Nobel Peace Prize with Firefox, you get hit by a backdoor which gained access to your computer. One of the Administrators of this website investigated the case, found out about what had happened, cleaned the site, did forensic examination, analyzed how they were breached, fixed everything, analyzed the exploit. He did a great job overall in fixing this. In fact, he did such a great job on fixing the problem that he got invited to the Nobel Peace Prize ceremony. 
he received an email. <laughs> an email sent by Alex Gladstein from Oslo Freedom Forum in New York, which is a real organization, and Alex Gladstein really exists. In fact, I, 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 I called up Mr. Gladstein and I spoke about this with him, and he confirmed that yes, that is his email address, yes, that's his signature, no, he did not send this email. And the attachment, an invitation to the Nobel Peace Prize ceremony, .pdf, if you open up the attachment, it is a real invitation to the real Nobel Peace Prize ceremony. And Mr. Gladstein confirmed that yes, that's a real invitation. And yes, it has an exploit and it has a Trojan. So where did the attackers get this file? Great question. I mean, these files don't exactly float around. You can't just Google for an invitation to the Nobel Peace Prize ceremony. We don't know where they got it from. An even better question, who's behind this attack? Who launched this attack? Which country launched this attack? I don't know. Denmark, maybe? <laughs> and of course, China has always denied any involvement in any espionage or in uh, online attacks, online warfare, any of that. But they did run into a slight problem earlier this year. There's a... Uh, TV channel called CCT7 in China, which is a TV channel run by the government for topics related to agriculture and military. And they published a documentary about online warfare earlier this year, and it's like a 20-minute propaganda documentary where two generals explain the concepts of cyber warfare and, and how to defend and how to attack and all that. Fairly normal document, but there's one interesting part of the documentary. Most likely by accident, they ended up leaving this one snippet, like a B-roll snippet in there, which very briefly shows someone opening up a Chinese application, choosing some settings and clicking a button. This lasts like five seconds. But we had that translated. What does the application actually say? And the application says at the top, it says, Copyright People Liberation Army, choose a target, Here's target lists. He chooses one which has an IP address and clicks a button which says attack. And the IP address is in the United States of America. <laughs> and that, this is, my friends, what I call the smoking gun. Right. Like, no matter what they say, the fact is they have written a program like this. And it is copyright PLA. And they showed this themselves on a propaganda documentary they made themselves, which was aired on a government channel. When we found out about this, um, when we, we put, it, put this in our blog, we, we guessed that it's going to disappear, the documentary is going to go away from the website, and it disappeared from the Chinese website two days later, hasn't returned. So most likely this was some sort of a goof. They weren't really supposed to put, make this public, but they did. So what's happening right now? Well, last year was the year of Stuxnet, which is the most complicated malware we've ever seen. And as you've read from the news, two weeks ago, a new Trojan called Duku was found. And Duku shares a lot with Stuxnet. It shares code, but even more importantly, I think, it shares techniques, including the fact that it has, it uses signed kernel drivers, which have been signed with real certificates, which have been stolen from companies in Taiwan. Stuxnet did this, Duku does this. In fact, one of the drivers used by Duku um, uh, is, is, uh, has been published by a company called J. Micron, which is a real company in Taiwan. And J. Micron was one of the driver signatures used in Stuxnet as well. I believe it is connected. If not done by the same party, well, one theory we, we do have is that if Stuxnet was done by U.S. government, it's likely they didn't write it themselves. They outsourced it to a defense contractor of some sort. Maybe it is that company, or maybe it is individuals from that company who participated in stocks that develop and doing something on their own now. Maybe it's that. We don't really know. But it isn't spreading. Duku is not a worm. Stocks that was a worm, it was spreading around the world. Duku isn't spreading. We found only a handful of infections. One of them in Hungary. Um, one of them... Uh, in a country I can't name, six, seven of them in Iran, which is interesting, and one of them in this country. That's Iran. This is 
Sudan in Africa. So we have a new Trojan with links to Stuxnet which has infected servers or computers in Iran and Sudan. What is the connection between Iran and Sudan? Well, if you go to the U.S. Department of State of list of countries that support terrorism, there's four countries on this list. Cuba, Syria, Iran, and Sudan. Now, this is probably a coincidence, right? So, that's the enemy we're fighting. We have the organized crime, we have the hacktivists, and then we have nation states. And while it's fairly clear that, you know, to fight crime you use police, it's also as clear that to fight attacks launched by other countries you don't use the police. That's not the task of police. If you look at the real world and one country goes into a war against another country, it's not the police that handles that, right? It's not a crime, it's war. So we probably shouldn't be expecting these nation-state attacks to be handled by traditional law enforcement either. That's not their job. But one thing is clear. We've probably seen only the very beginning of all of these problems. And it's highly likely the situation is going to get much worse before it gets better. And that means that for us working in security, well, there's job security in security. Thank you.